Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Voxology Podcast. We've got big news today, ladies and gentlemen. Big we news. are recording video as well as audio. Look out. Um, if you are interested in matching our faces with our voices, um, you can go to YouTube. What's the YouTube uh, channel? What's our channel? I think it's just at Voxology. At Voxology? Yeah, but I'll have a link. Well, I mean, YouTube backslash Voxology. Nice. I think we have we have a YouTube channel now, and we are recording this episode on YouTube. So yeah, it will yeah. be released per standard releasing, but it will also there's also a treat if you want to see what we look like. And let me just say, in Tim's instance, that will help. In another instance, it might not. So you may simply want to not go to YouTube and just simply picture <laughs> two <publicity>. very intelligent <laughs> looking men in tweed sport coats with it's too elbow bad we don't, patches. We can't do like an AI video, or we should maybe we should deep fake. Oh, these that's funny. And... Deep fake. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, who would your deep fake be? I don't know, but I saw somebody does a deep fake on Instagram, and they just take scenes from movies that you're familiar with, and they put Arnold's face on who the main character is, and totally, then revoice the dialogue. I'm totally with his. in. <laughs> I am completely. And well, totally the, old, in the for oldest that. one is they did Arnold and Sylvester Stallone <clears throat> on Will Ferrell and John C. Riley's faces from Step Brothers. Oh, good lord, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> That's funny. That's pretty good. All right, let's let's look at our background. So so Tim, this is your basement, which is uh, an office kind yep. of Art Deco studio. This is my over, cave. Over over your left shoulder, what is that big picture? It's a rad painting, uh, ink painting that one of my good friends did, uh, and I just stole it and framed it because I love I, it. I like that. And then we've yeah. got some good throw pillows on the couch. Yeah, and then yeah, it's our well old done. couch, old pillows. Yep. Yeah, that's fair. And what's nice is the pillows match your face. Just the, sort Great. of the coloring. Well, I like. I'm it. not going to get unmatching pillows. And then there is absolutely no personality in my background. It's gray with no lights on, <laughs> and it looks like a suburban, which it is, house. It's nice because you have the cord candles. coming out of your head, right there. Yeah, that's the power cord to my brain. I'm sorry if you're listening in your car. We're gonna. We're, it's gonna take a little bit for us to get used to being public yeah. figures now. And so, like, <laughs> Tim, man, Tim picks his teeth right in the middle of episodes. It's so embarrassing. Oh, yeah. You're gonna have to stop doing. There's that. a lot of habits that are gonna have to change. I know this is really tough. So anyway, hello everybody. Time, What's that? I wore clothes this time. True, dude. And let me just say, on on the back of that, I shaved today. And I'm freshly shorn today just for this for this momentous occasion. So um, anyway, it'll take us an episode or two to get used to the fact that that people will see us as we're doing this. So sorry if we uh, play a bit to the camera or me anyway. Yes, there it is. Let's look at the camera together. All right. So we are starting a new series today. Coincidentally, we are launching our YouTube channel. Wow. And we are starting a series of conversations on the book of Revelation. It's almost Very like someone planned it that way. I know. I know. And Serendipity. I want to say, by the way, that I hope you have a good day because we want to play. No, I want to. I, I didn't mean for that all of that to rhyme. I want to say. Yeah, I like, Where is this going? <laughs> no, nowhere. That is a, that is a uh, poetic cul-de-sac right there. No, I just want to say thank you to our supporters, both on tithe.ly and Patreon, for allowing us to um, edit this, to buy the equipment, to do all of this stuff. We're so grateful um, for your support. We really are. And this is part of. Uh, we're trying a bunch of new things in 2023, and uh, this is one of the biggest. Um, and we have some some more things coming that we'll tell you about later. First thing, though, I want to give a shout out to Chris with a K. Okay, so this is Chris with a K, who I am a neuropsychologist in a state psychiatric hospital. And sometimes the environment can weigh on a person. Now, 
and then he talks about you know that he's enjoyed the podcast. But can I just give a shout out to someone who works like with the most marginalized of the marginalized? Yeah, I mean, seriously. holy, co- holy, coley, holy, holy, Chris, coley. holy moly, Chris, well done, dude. Just shout out to you with a K, and then secondly, shout out to you with an A because your life is awesome. Um, I really think that's amazing, and, it, and 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 I know there are a bunch of you have chaplains and ministers and business folks and all sorts of missionaries, all sorts of people listening. Uh, but but that as as Chris wrote us a very nice email. Um, I just noticed how many how many uh, like neuroscientists are out there. I don't think there are many, let alone those that are working in the state psychiatric, psychiatric hospitals. That's yeah. pretty freaking ridiculous. It's intense. So, Chris, well done, dude. We're proud of you, and we are absolutely delighted that you find some of this babbling helpful. <laughs> Speaking of babbling, we're going to start a, a series of conversations on uh, the Book of Revelation. And um, I want to, um, for, for those of you watching on YouTube, I want to show you some of the books that I'm going to be referencing. Uh, for those of you listening, I will read the titles of the books, but you will not get the beautiful visual. So uh, one of the books is uh, David De Silva, Seeing, uh, Seeing Things God's Way. Nope, John's Way. Sorry. Oh. I know I, I had it turned around so I couldn't read it. Seeing Things John's Way. The rhetoric of the book of Revelation. Really, really interesting take on Revelation as, um, as a riff on some of the beliefs about astral spirits in the first century. Oh, wow. That's really know. interesting. Um, the second one is Apocalypse and Allegiance, Worship, Politics, and Devotion in the Book of Revelation, J. Nelson Craybill. And um, man, this book is phenomenal about... Uh, the background of Caesar worship and what was happening in the Roman Empire at that time and how the liturgies in Revelation undercut uh, the worship of the beast. Uh, This is a really great volume. It's called Seven Congregations in a Roman Crucible uh, by Richard Oster, or Oster. And it's about the seven churches, their historical background and what they're facing. And it's super in-depth. And really well thought out. Uh, if you want more about the imperial cults, here's the imperial cults and the apocalypse of John. I know, right? Uh, Stephen J. Friesen, reading Revelation in the Ruins. Um, and this is a very, it's, it's a little dated, but it, um, it shows how the imperial cult reconfigured time and space and uh, all sorts of things that Revelation then kind of um, configures back right. to, uh, to be congruent with uh, the scriptures. Um, Unveiling Empire, Revelation Then and Now, Wes Howard Brook and Anthony Guire. And uh, this is a really great uh, and excellent read on um, why it is that Babylon is the image that's used to describe the Roman Empire. And then two really accessible intro books. If you're, <laughs> that's a whole library. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. This isn't all of them. This isn't all of them. But two really accessible intro books. Um, one is called "Unholy Allegiances," and it's called "Heeding Revelation's <laughs> Warning." And that it's cover is that cover is horrific, terrible. terrible. You don't read these for covers, ladies and gentlemen. But this is no. by that David De Silva guy, and this is an intro. But it, it is a very, very accessible, popular level book on this. And then the the big one, this one, look at all those post-it notes. Whoa. I know, right? This is, I've read this four or five times. It's called Reading Revelation Responsibly very by Michael Gorman. The title. Yes. The three R's. The three R's. His subtitle is. R, R, R. No. Uns, is that the pirate movie? No, it's a movie that's nominated for a bunch of awards. The Bollywood action movie that's out right now. Mm. I can't say that I have. Yeah, have no. you seen Bullet Train with the Brad Pitt action movie? Yeah, that's juicy. Juicy. Brad Pitt is just a dreamy guy. Now, reading Revelation responsibly is a phenomenal. I mean, every Christian in America should read that book. 
Just don't order it from Amazon because it may not show up. I know. Tim ordered it, what, two weeks ago? At least. I know, and it's still not there. So um, I I just wanted to kind of cite some of my sources. Today, I am borrowing a lot from reading Revelation responsibly. And um, if, if I could recommend one book to you, it doesn't require you to have this, you know, large scholarly background. This is the book. It's an, an incredible, incredible book. Now, the way I want to come into Revelation, and we're going to break this up. This isn't going to be like twenty-seven weeks on Revelation. <laughs> We've got more Gombas to cover. Famous We've got some interviews. Words. We've got some interviews scheduled, and and we're not going to take our, you know, an hour-long episode going through Revelation. We're gonna we're gonna break this up into chunks, but. I want to frame Revelation as an answer to um, Christian nationalism. And so I want to spend a little time talking about Christian nationalism. I didn't even know that phrase until January 6th, two years ago, (laughs) when, like uh, many of us, I was watching from my home uh, wondering what the former president was going to do regarding his threats to fight the election results and, um, you know, some of our worst kind of imaginings, well, I didn't even imagine this sort of nonsense. So even beyond the worst imaginings sort of came true. We're watching uh, people storm the Capitol, people beat um, police officers, a woman get shot trying to break into one of the places. I mean, what, a, what an absolute horrific, horrific site that was and we've learned now that it's not just american right we're exporting yes yeah. evidently to brazil but um one of the things that um i began to to really zero in on while that was happening was a bunch of imagery about jesus and there were uh flags with crosses uh there was a there were prayer gatherings kind of once the <laughs> You know, the, the inner chambers had been broken into. They were praying. Yeah. Um, one of the groups that, that had organized this was seen praying before, like in Jesus' name, praying before they, yeah. they went and did this. Um, there was tr- the Christian flag. There were signs that said, you know, Jesus is, is my savior, but Trump is my president. Um, it was, I mean, so not only was it vexing and... Um, I was I was very very angry about this, but the Christian symbolism that was present um, was I mean horrifying. I don't I don't even have a word strong enough, and um, the fact that that happened bad enough, but the fact that it was baptized with Christian imagery, um, man, that makes it blasphemous. Yeah, and so so I began to ask like many of you. So what, what exactly led to this? How is it that Jesus got co-opted in service of America? And had I been paying attention prior to January 6th, I would have noticed that had been happening significantly for the last um, 50 years, but e- even earlier than that. And so there became a branch of study known as um, the study of Christian nationalism, And I read a book a couple of years ago called Taking America Back for God. And it was written by Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, a couple of social scientists. And they spent some time talking about Christian nationalism. Now, I've also heard Christian nationalism being thrown around, you know, just as another pejorative of like woke. So, you know, you can, it's a catch all that just means, well, I don't like the way you love America, so I'm going to call you a Christian nationalist. There are other people who've embraced the term and said, heck yeah, I'm a Christian nationalist. Right. I am proud uh, to be American. And so w- what I love about the book is that they, they take pains to describe specifically what they mean by this. And, um, and so I want to go through maybe 10 minutes worth of um, some of their research and then draw a couple of conclusions that lead us then into the book of Revelation. Sound good, Timothy? Sweet. Let's do it. Let's do this. All right. So uh, one of the ways they define Christian nationalism is they say um, uh, Christian nationalism describes an ideology that idealizes and advocates a fusion 
of American civil life with a particular type of Christian identity and culture. The traditions, symbols, narratives, and value systems that it idealizes and advocates are uh, represent a fusion of a, a brand of Christianity with American civil life. Right, so uh, Christian nationalism provides a complex uh, system of explicit and implicit ideals, values, and myths, a whole cultural framework through which Americans can perceive and navigate the world. All right, now that doesn't really clarify what we're talking about. So they delineate what they mean by nationalism. They don't mean patriotism, like, hey, I'm really glad that I live here, because I'm really glad that I live here. I love our country. My dad served uh, and was a police officer. My stepdad served. My father-in-law served. Um, so I have, I have a great deal of affection for the place that I reside, as I know you do as well. But they don't, they don't mean love of country. They mean nationalism, or what they call it is nationism. Yeah. A commitment to a vision of American civil life and polity as closely intertwined with an identity tied to a politically conservative strand of Christianity. So it's not just generic patriotism that's at issue here. It's that fusion between politically conservative uh, politics with a certain brand of Christianity. And they're very clear. They go on to define what they mean by Christian. Christian does not refer to doctoral orthodoxy or personal piety. Um, Christian here, in this very specific sense, refers to historical identity, cultural preeminence, and political influence that's tied to, again, the fusion of Christianity and American civil life. It often contains ideological content that is implicit. This includes symbolic boundaries that conceptually blur and conflate religious identity Christian, preferably Protestant, with race, white, nativity, born in the U.S., citizenship, American, and political ideology, social and fiscally conservative. Yeah. The Christianity of um, Christian uh, nationalism includes assumptions of nativism, white supremacy, patriarchy, and heteronormativity, along with the divine sanction for authoritarian control and militarism. It is an ethnic and it is as ethnic and political as it is religious. God demands our allegiance to our national Christian identity. All right, so so they're very specific. Christian national isn't Christian nationalism isn't a religion, properly speaking. It often influences Americans' opinions and behaviors in the exact opposite direction of traditional religious commitment. Now, what they do is they back all of this up with research. They're not just making yeah. assertions here. And they talk about all the examples that many of us are familiar of, right? Full-on patriotic celebrations in American churches, Celebrate America services on July 4th weekend, uh, bringing in right-wing commentators to, to preach from pulpits, um, advocating for certain policies from our church platforms, um, and they go into a bit of the myth that Christian nationalists believe, which is America has a special relationship to God. Our founding documents were inspired, not the same way the Bible was, but definitely more than just the dude's thoughts. Right. <laughs> and it was revealed to Christian men with intentions to preference Christianity. Like the founding documents, according to Christian nationalists, preference Christianity over other faiths. And, and then here's the problem. The United States has failed in its devotion to God and his principles, and God has withdrawn his hand of blessing. So we must reclaim America for Christ. Right? right? That's the story. And, and the verse that's used is 2 Chronicles 7. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, then I will bless their land, and so on. And, you know, I mean, that was Israel. And so what sits behind... This is the conflation of Israel with America. What Israel was to the world in the days of the Old Testament, America is to the world today. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, the idea is God has always been on our side. We are God's unique agent in the world. And the American government should unapologetically privilege Christianity. 
So when <laughs> which it does, Christians aren't um, are threatened or marginalized when Christianity's former preeminence is questioned, um, will turn to authoritarian figures to deal with those threats. So the reason Trump, no one, uh, well, I don't know. I shouldn't say no one. <laughs> I was extremely puzzled by evangelicalism's embrace of Donald Trump after years of telling us that character matters, um, right. who we vote for. But I, I began to realize that, that Trump represented, that he represented himself as the defender of the power and values that many perceive are being threatened. So we've got to make America great again. We get to say, we get to say Merry Christmas again. Evangelicals, you don't even know how much power you have. Now, a couple more disclaimers. I'm sorry I'm just giving this in big chunks, but this is super important for a reason that will become obvious. They, they also specify that Christian nationalism is not equivalent to white evangelicalism. All right? There is overlap between white evangelicals and Christian nationalists, um, uh, but they, they estimate about that overlap being about 50% of uh, white evangelicals are Christian nationalists. The others are not. And they, and they break, they, 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 because they're social scientists, they create a taxonomy of people who are resisting Christian nationalism, people who are accepting it and advocating it, accommodating to it, rejecting it. And, um, and there are loads of people who are not Christian who are Christian nationalists. Right. And there, are, and there are lots of people who are white evangelicals who are not Christian nationalists. So that's, we're not referring to the same subset of people. They also specify... It's a Venn diagram. They also, yes... They also specify that Christian nationalisms aren't advocating theocracy. There are there is a branch of Christianity that that advocates theocracy, where we use um, political processes to implement Old Testament and New Testament law. Christian nationalists are willing to put up with very unpious, impious characters. Uh, in the service of advancing their agenda, whereas you know most um, theocrats are not. Uh, Twenty, depending on how you phrase the question, twenty to fifty percent of Americans agree that the U.S. is a Christian nation, and the government should uh, recognize this. Forty-two percent of Americans agree that the success of the United States is part of God's plan, and two-thirds of Americans agree that God has granted America a special role in human history. All right? They, they, so, so that's just some background in the first, like, 30 pages of the book. Now, here's something that gets really interesting. They, they began to rummage around in the beliefs that undergird. Undergird. Uh, undergird. Undergird your loins. Uh, the <laughs> beliefs that undergird. Gird. The beliefs that undergird, remember Gird's words and way. <laughs> it's just a weird word. The beliefs that undergird or predict strong adherence to Christian nationalism. All right, and here are some of the beliefs. All right, so there's a there's causation and correla correlation between adherence to these beliefs and embracing of Christian nationalism. Right. So, um, and these are strongest to weakest. So identifying with political conservatism is number one. Identity as a Bible-believing person is number two. Believing the Bible is the literal word of God and perfectly true. Uh, religious practice. Belief that the nation is on the brink of moral decay. Belief that God requires the faithful to wage wars for good. And then here, here was the one that jumped out at me a couple of years ago. Belief in the rapture. Oh, interesting. <laughs> totally interesting. And the more they got into, and this is, gets us into Revelation, right? And the more they got into kind of the undergird of, um, <laughs> of Christian nationalistic belief, the more they found an apocalyptic worldview, yeah. That was aligned with a certain understanding of Revelation. 
makes sense. Oh, it totally makes sense. So I'm just going to read a couple of um, a couple of quotes from them. Proponents of Christian nationalism have consistently viewed their mission through the lens of apocalyptic Christianity. Typically, they fall into one or two categories. Post-millennials, not post-millennial like, you know, right. your age, but millennial like, what's your view of the millennium? Yeah. Post-millennial believe that Christ's kingdom is already established on earth so and his Gen followers... Z. This is Gen what? Z kids. These are Gen Z kids, the post... Uh... Oh, that's funny. Post-millennials, that's yeah. funny. Um, meaning that Christ's kingdom is already established on earth and his followers should bring every aspect of American civil life under his reign. And we'll talk about the millennium and how that view ties together. Or, he said they're premillennial, they believe the world will become increasingly corrupt until Christ returns to rescue the faithful, followed by his millennial reign on earth. Their role, in, uh, folks who see it this way, their role is to delay the world's eventual destruction so that more people can come to Christ, is the idea. But, but the thing that was fascinating, and I, I just didn't, I mean, it makes sense when you hear it, but I, I didn't put it together when I'm watching this unfold on January 6th. Um, so there is a certain apo apocalyptic view of Revelation that feeds directly into the actions um, and beliefs of, of Christian nationalists. And, and, and not just, I mean, and we're not saying that strain of thinking around Revelation um, is automatically leads you to th such things. Right. But it's certainly, they identified it as a predictor. Uh, it's another would, circle of the Venn diagram. Another circle of the Venn, that's right. Um, all in all, we're just another circle in the Venn diagram. That's right. Um, one, one last thing. Um, attributes of Christian nationalism. And um, Christian nationalism, when it's held by white Americans, appears to reinforce boundaries around national group membership, encouraging antipathy and mistrust towards those who do not meet the membership requirements of native-born white and Christian. Uh, Christian nationalists tend to promote the defenses of authoritarian control, especially when the target population of that control is non-white. So the people who are upset at the black people who are riding around George Floyd um, had no problem with storming the Capitol um, and, and didn't really pay much attention to that double standard. Um, Christian nationalists also tend to hold a social order that champions hierarchies between men and women. And Christian nationalists are more likely to be authoritarian, ethnocentric, and racially prejudiced. So the fact that the Bible, not shockingly, is, um, one of, you know, is one of the things that undergirds this <laughs> belief system and is deployed as, as evidence for it, as proof of it and justification of it. Well, I don't know. We at the Vox podcast may have a, a bit of a concern a and not long. only, not only. I mean, let's talk about how the book of Revelation has been deployed in the world by the church. I mean, what a crap show this is, right? So, so for some of us, the book of Revelation is purely an object of curiosity, right? We're, we're a prophecy buff, and we love biblical prophecy. And so it's just, is it a puzzle to figure out? Is it a code to decode? Who is doesn't a, love a 12-headed dragon? Totally! <laughs> So, so for some, it's just that. It's just this kind of intellectual exercise. So for we gotta get others, the AI generators going on that. Oh, dude, yes, that's what we need for art for yep. this series. Now, Tim, is this all making sense? Yes. Okay. So sometimes it's deployed as an object of curiosity. Sometimes, and this is how I I came to experience the Book of Revelation. It is used to create fear in order to um, encourage conversion. Yeah. And so uh, there is not a lot of, um, there are not a lot of pictures of hell um, in the Bible that, um, you know, that, that kind of create the eternally conscious, tormented view that most of us grew up with. But they're found in Revelation, and so Revelation is kind of deployed 
to to talk about hell in that yeah, regard. That's crazy imagery too to bet like to totally. It's not so just we, hell and that kind of stuff, but there's all these creatures and Oh yeah, we're going to talk about all of it. It's going to yeah. be it's going to be as they say glorious, a glorious yeah. appearing as they say. So it's an object of curiosity. It's used to create fear and anxiety. Will you be left behind? I mean, all of the stuff. <laughs> um, as we've seen, it's it's used to justify the American story. Um, there's a great deal of money to be made um, w- around prophecy conferences, conspiracy theories. Um, I mean, the Left Behind book sold like 80 million copies or totally. something at last count. Um, we also it also creates and has been deployed to justify raping and pillaging the environment uh, because it's all going to burn anyway. Yep. It's been used to justify all manner of violence from the Crusades onward. Um, it's been used to justify all manner of violence. Even Driscoll, the pud, um, talks about pud. Jesus. <laughs> oh, can't stand him. It talks about Jesus coming back on a horse with a sword. And totally neglects every bit of context in, in order American to talk flag. about. Well, yeah, he, he uses that to talk about, to justify his view of masculinity, which, right. oh, so, so, I mean, beyond erroneous, it is yeah. harmful. This crap yeah. is harmful. Um, or, like most of us, because of all that nonsense, we just ignore the entire book completely. And we kind of end the Bible like at the end of Paul's letters. We don't go into the Peters or Jude or Hebrews or Revelation. It's like, <laughs> nope. That stuff's a little too weird for me. So, the big point we want to make today. Good theology does not save us, but bad theology harms us. All right? You can have great theology and not um, be a part of the kingdom. You can have great theology and keep Christ at a distance. Demons in the in the scriptures have great theology. Like right. every time Jesus is roaming around, his family doesn't know who he is. The crowds don't know who he is. The, the disciples do. don't know. They do. And he has to shut them up over and over <laughs> and over so they don't ruin it. It's hilarious. So this whole thing we've made about being theologically correct, yes, good theology helps, but good theology doesn't save. But bad theology, holy crap, that harms us. Yeah. That harms us. And so I, I don't give a rat's patootie about... Um, rat's pud. About... I don't even know where that word came from. <laughs> I don't even know. About, about whether or not people are sick of having these conversations or they think Christian nationalism is just this, you know, just, a, just the other side of the woke, you know... The woke pejorative. Which I imagine from Jesus' perspective, like you show up, you subvert everybody's expectations politically and kind of like in this nationalistic way of, you know, literally doing that, showing up on a horse with a sword wrapped in Israel's flag. Right. And now here we are, you know, thousands of years later doing exactly that. Like after all this time, all that work, we're totally. like, hey. This is all about this nationalistic pride and force and strength. Yep. And well, think about what the so I mean that's fascinating, bro. Because so at, at the church I'm at, we're going through the Book of Mark, and one of the things that's super interesting about the Book of Mark is that Jesus keeps announcing that he's going to the capital to die, and their nation's capital, and he's going to go die, and the disciples continually like either willingly or maliciously or ignorantly try to talk him out of it. Yeah. They want to go sit at his right and left hand. They want to argue about who's the greatest, right? So they think they're going to storm the Capitol for revolution. And Jesus storms the Capitol in order to be put to death by the authorities. You want a revolution? I want a revelation. That's the name of the whole series right there. Where's that come from? You told me. I forgot. Hamilton. There, of course. It all, it all goes back. So, doggone it. We are going to take some time on this. And, um, and so, we're, we're going to do two things at the same time. The one thing we're going to talk about a lot is how do you understand Revelation. Yeah. And while we talk about how you understand Revelation, we're going to be understanding Revelation in certain ways. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so uh, here are the disclaimers. Tons of smart people disagree, of course. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and your view of revelation does not save you or determine whether or not you're a good Christian. Um, I want to argue against certain ways the book has been interpreted because they've created harm. And yeah. they've, they've besmirched, since we're using big words today, the witness of Jesus and obscured the beauty of Jesus. And we're seeing it today. And there are people who are very unthoughtful and uncritical people who are embracing this label as um, uncritically. Yeah. And you're just going, no, guys, this to, to, to embrace this is to reject Christ. There, there is really no, there's no way of holding this nationalistic picture and following the lamb who was slain at the same time. Yeah, you're not following the lamb, you're following the pud. We've got an elephant version and a donkey version, so it's great. Anyway. So we're going to pick apart that version. Yes. While simultaneously understanding what it, why this book is even here. Yes. So the first couple of episodes are going to be abstract, and they're going to talk about hermeneutical principles. Now, hermeneutics is one of those sweet Bible words. Well, it's not even a Bible word. It's a theologian word that talks about how you approach understanding the Bible. Yeah. We all come to the Bible with certain assumptions about us and about the Bible and about what the Bible should do to us. Yeah. And that, that whole arena is called hermeneutics. And so um, one of the things I've learned to do is to try to talk about my assumptions going into a text. And we did this during the Bible series a lot. Yeah. Um, my assumptions going into a text because that will affect then how the text is interpreted. Totally. Um, exegesis is the study of the text. Oh, I thought that was when Jesus leaves the room. When Jesus exits, it's exit Jesus. Yeah. Absolutely. Eisegesis is where I bring something to the text and read something that isn't in the text. And I'm going to argue that a lot of commentators of Revelation have done that. They've read modern... Uh, Western democracy and American concerns back into Revelation that wouldn't have made zero freaking sense to anybody in the first century. Like, the, um, what was it that you always heard growing up? It was like the giant uh, locusts were Apache attack helicopters. helicopters. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Which was very exciting when you're a kid and you're like, whoa, okay. Yeah, this was totally. a time travel future prediction. And we've got helicopters, so guess what? They're already here. We are the beast. Yeah. That's the issue. And, and that's what's so fascinating. We're, I mean, dude, this is so good. I mean, so good. This is such good stuff. The book should not be scary and confusing. The book was actually meant to comfort people <laughs> just like us. The book right. was meant to provide hope and to encourage adherence and allegiance to Jesus, even in the face of being marginalized. Yeah. You know, and so, so for those of us who feel threatened, uh, for certainly, I mean, I, and I, I just want to say from the outset, I don't, I, I don't think any, anything anywhere can threaten the movement of Jesus of Nazareth. I don't think the gospel is under threat. I don't think by avatar or um, politics or by wars or, or pandemics, uh, I have zero anxiety about how say God's avatar? doing today. Yeah, Driscoll. I don't know why he's shown up in my feed. This Twitter, Twitter's done this for you. There are two feeds now. There's one for people you follow, and then there's one that's recommended for you. Oh, I haven't seen that. And back years ago, when Avatar first came out, he had this whole thing about how it was it was pagan and demonic, and and so he's reintroducing that again. I, you know, and I'm just uh, befuddled at all befuddled. of it. Befuddled. But when people say, you know, the gospel's under threat, nope, the gospel isn't under threat. But there are loads of us who feel that it is. Right. And so, and we'll use Revelation to create anxiety where Revelation was intended to um, alleviate it and to restore, you know, joyful noncompliance with That's the patterns so of this world. Yeah, yeah, totally. This was written to comfort, baby. And the fact that it doesn't mean it's been used as... And, and Paul talks about this. He talks about the Torah of death. The, mm. so, so like when the Torah is deployed in ways that divide a congregation totally. and marginalize, he calls it the Torah of death. Well, this is the revelation of death, 
right? This is the revelation that's been used in so many awful, horrific ways. And we're going to read the revelation of life. Well, we're going to, we're going to approach it differently. <laughs> and, and I do want to say, because I remember we did, we did some of this uh, years ago. Um, oh, with the Bible series, we talked about genre. And somebody said, it must be so great you know, to sit in your rightness and, you know, declare that so many from church history have been wrong. And, and part you of me what? is like, it is great. Yeah. <laughs> well, part of me, part of me is like, well, I never want to come across like that, but I got to tell you, I am really convinced that what we've been doing is wrong, like deeply wrong and deeply harmful and does violence to the book. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to pull a lot of those punches, but I'm, as always, the reason I went over the books earlier is because, you know, I, I rarely have original thoughts. And if I do, I read C.S. Lewis and realize, nope, he's thought them before and said them better. So there's no <laughs> point in even having them. Anyway, let's start with some background. We'll spend, I don't know, maybe 15 more minutes on this because this episode's long enough. And, you know, Oh, you know what? Wanna... Speaking of uh, C.S. Lewis. Yes. Um, our mutual friend yesterday told me about a ski, like a ski run that's called Narnia, but with the G, like gnarly. It's like, man, that would be such a good metal band name. Like, yo, yes. You, and the shirts are, they designed themselves. Narnia. We're Narnia. One, two, three, four. <laughs> The horse and his boy. <laughs> That's right. See, there's not a lot of great, you know, punk rock imagery to work with, but it's kind of like a guar thing or something like yeah, that. Yeah, totally. It totally. like there's a Black Sabbath cover band that they all dress like McDonald's characters and it's called Mac Sabbath. But they no. just play Sabbath no. songs, but they're all dressed like the lead singer's Ronald McDonald. And there's a Grimace no. and a Hamburglar. <laughs> I would be the, I would be Grimace. Who would you want to be? You would be Hamburglar, dude. Seriously. Just you got around. those beady, you got those beady eyes, man. <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, let's do a little bit of background. All right. We're going to take the rest of this episode and next episode to just do some background work on this sucker. That's right. H historically, there have been um, four different interpretive strategies to, to this book and um and and i'll kind of go over them uh, a little bit in detail and then we'll refer to them often but obviously the main one we're all familiar with is called the futurist approach or the predictive approach and it's the idea that revelation is mostly future oriented and it's a timeline or a calendar of the events that will happen in the last days. Um, and, and I got to say, this view of Revelation has been present all throughout church history. Um, <laughs> Gorman has this great quote. He says, history is littered with failed attempts to use Revelation to predict history. Um, and so usually uh, right around like the turn of millennia, um, Revelation gets a lot of attention. So uh, uh, 1,000 uh, A.D., 2,000 A.D., right? There was the kind Y2K. of millennial, yes, millennial fervor. Um, any, anytime there's this kind of epoch event that's happening in human history, Revelation gets noticed. And like the Gulf War instantly was like, totally. you know, yep. oh, yeah, this is, this is it. This and is there the were big the helicopters, one. yeah. The, this is Gog and Magog, guys. And, um, and so this... this um, this approach is the one that most of us are, are familiar with. We live in the last days. Jesus is coming back, and Jesus gave us signs to look for. And part of what the role of the church is, is to understand the times, as Jesus said uh, to the Pharisees, and to take notes so that we're prepared when he, when he returns. And um, that return can be in the form of the rapture or depending the second coming, but he's coming back and we can kind of get a, an advanced preview of how it's going to go. And part of the appeal of the Left Behind series was, um, was, was that part of it, the conspiracy, the, the world's uniting against the Christians, we're persecuted and we have to, to rise up, you know, in the it's name the of Jesus. the greatest hits of the, the current Christian model. Totally. We're the persecuted ones, but we're the chosen ones. Yes. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And that same dynamic played in Israel, right? In, right. in good and bad ways. So um, the, the thing we want to note about the <laughs> futuristic approach. So boring. We're just a rerun. Yes. We're not like even just, creative. No. <laughs> we're not even creative. Um, the most common form of the futuristic approach is something called dispensationalism. And this, this is what I studied in seminary. I was taught that this is the way the Bible is to be understood. Yeah. And um, dispensationalism was popularized um, in the 1800s uh, in America by a guy named John Darby. Um, his Darby's teaching got inputted into the first kind of reference Bible ever called the Schofield Reference Bible, which uh, channeled Darby's dispensational teaching. But, it, but again, people were not sophisticated enough to realize that the reference Bible, the references weren't the Bible, they were the interpretations, and they weren't even universal interpretations. This was a uniquely American belief that developed. Um, and then Hal Lindsey, that's how I discovered them. Hal Lindsey wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. Yeah. And, um, and then Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins got a hold of it and uh, channeled it and popularized it and made it enormous through the Left Behind series. Um, dispensationalists, they, they see God relating to human history through different dispensations. So uh, pre-fall, God relates to Adam and Eve a certain way. After the fall, he relates to Adam and Eve a certain way. Pre-Sinai, he relates to Israel a certain way. After Sinai, he relates to Israel a different way. Yeah. And so on and so on and so on. So they disagree as to the number of dispensations. But in the divine story, they see the, the connection of a seven-year tribulation um, to Revelation 6 through 19. And they see the weeks of Daniel 9 being played out during the, the revelation, the first three and a half years of the tribulation is good. The Antichrist then manifests himself. The next three and a half years are, uh, are bad as the whole world worships the beast. And so um, the futuristic orientation has been around forever, but the iteration we're familiar with is uniquely American. Um, and, and, and there's a bit of American exceptionalism to this, which right. obviously feeds into what we we're talking about before. So the first, uh, the first overly simplified approach is futurist. The second is preterist and preterist comes from a Latin word that means past tense. There are uh, people, and I am one of them who believe that, uh, most of revelation uh, took place in the first century and was about what happened in the first century. Now, there are some people uh, who date the, the, the book of Revelation before the fall of Jerusalem, um, and that was in AD 70, who believe that Revelation is about the fall of Jerusalem. Hmm. Um, I do not. I date the, the book of Revelation late during the reign of the Emperor Domitian in AD 90s, and I actually think the book of Revelation is about the coming persecution of the Roman Empire. And I think there are future aspects to the book, but the book doesn't make sense um, unless you understand that it made sense in the first century. Right. So the book is about what was going on in the first century. That doesn't preclude that it has relevance to us. It certainly does, but that relevance isn't measured by a calendar. Um, that relevance is measured in other ways. So there's, it's all future or mostly future. It's all past or mostly past. Then there's a view that's called the spiritual view or the idealist view. And it's about, it's not historically based, but it's about the never ending struggle between good and evil yeah. using symbols that, you know, were you know, uh, readily available during the time of its writing, but still speak to us today that, that revelation is almost a picture of what's continually happening. Um, and there were church fathers who held this view. Um, and then, uh, and, and then a branch of this view is something called the historic, historicist view, which means that Revelation was predicting the unfolding history of the church. And so that there are like the seven churches in Revelation represent seven church ages um, of the history of the church. And so there are two views that are focused on time. It's future or past. And then there are two views that are focused on, nope, it's not really time-based, 
although the historic historicist perspective say it is it is correlated to time but it's not predictive time right. it's 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 giving us a lens through which to view church history and then the spiritualist or idealist view has no interest in kind of time or history whatsoever this is just symbolizing the ongoing struggle of good and evil it's like star wars right, right? there's yeah. you can tell that story and make up a thousand symbolic universes to tell that story a thousand different ways. Right. All right. So those are the four views that are traditionally taken to understanding the book. And those views actually end up mattering because how you come into the book, understanding what the book is about, will, inter will determine how you interpret some of the crazy passages. Totally. Right? When you, yeah. when you see the red dragon... Um, or you read the number of the beast, which is 666, are you assuming that there are many beasts? Are, is there just one and we already had it? Is there one coming in the future that we haven't met yet? Right? How you determine those individual and specific things um, goes a great, a, a long way in determining how it is that you approach right. you know, the specific passages. Similar to the genre the Yes. We're going to do genre next week. You bet. Now, Michael Gorman, in his book, um, gives a list of um, mistakes that people make in uh, interpreting the book and antidotes for those mistakes. Oh, nice. So, so I'm, I'm literally, and I know this is a slog, y'all, so that's why I'm going to wrap it after this, because um, I know this is dense and a lot of content, but that's the point. The whole book of Revelation is determined here. How you understand every bit of revelation is determined by how you approach it, what genre decisions you make about it, and what decisions you make about interpretation before you even open the pages of the book. Right. <laughs> so, so even though this is the most boring stuff, it's actually the most important. Um, and it's hugely significant. So, so I'll end on these. He gives six of these. And I'm just reading literally uh, quotes from um, his book. He has a little chart. So for those of you on YouTube, there's the first sentence of the chart. Mistake number one, failing to recognize that Revelation is a work of apocalyptic literature. So we're going to talk about that when we get to genre. This Revelation is not primarily um a uh, a book of the bible that's predictive it's a book of the bible that's apocalyptic and and, there, and that is word is used in a very specific way that's the mistake the failure to realize what genre of revelation uh, yeah. of revelation is the antidote is understanding the features of apocalyptic literature in the first century symbolism poetry the appeal to imagination and understanding the function of apocalyptic literature which was to provide comfort and challenge and hope. So, I mean, that's a big deal. Secondly, it's a huge deal because, like you started, it's opposite of the way that we, it's landed for totally. a very long time. Yes. Number two, and this is a doozy as well, failing to take Revelation seriously as a product of and a message to its own time. Right. That's the mistake. What's the antidote? We're to look for all of the clues for its meaning in late first century uh, Asia Minor. Now, Revelation is going to dialogue with two streams of thought, and we're going to see this over and over and over. First stream of thought is the Old Testament. One of the reasons why Revelation is really vague to us and hard to understand is because we are not Old Testament people. We don't read it. We don't know it. Even when we read it devotionally, we don't understand it. And so Revelation is channeling. There's nothing new in Revelation except for the surprise of the slain lamb. But everything else in Revelation is hinted at or alluded to before. So there are 400 verses, I think, in Revelation, and there are over 400 allusions to the wow. Old Testament in its pages. I mean, it's just drenched with Old Testament imagery. And because we're not, we think, oh, okay, well, it must be talking about you know, totally. Apache helicopters. We use our imagine, yeah. Totally. Uh, so, so one stream of dialogue um, is the Old Testament. Uh, the other stream of dialogue is in Roman imperial propaganda. And man, are we going to see that. That was 
Asia Minor was the center of the world for the worship of the emperors. And uh, the cities of Asia Minor tried to outdo each other in their grandiose, like, temple structures to declare their allegiance to the Roman emperors. And so um, John is writing to people who are either being persecuted and are in trouble, or they're in trouble because they're not being persecuted and fully at home with the status quo. Hmm. And so there are parts that challenge those of us who are at home in the status quo, but the book was provided primarily to comfort those who are on the margins of the empire. Thirdly, from Gorman, postulating arbitrary contemporary fulfillment of the symbols and visions of Revelation based on the dubious assumption that prophecy and history must be culminating in our day. Right. Oh, so good. The so time is instead, here and now. Yes. Our time and our place is the most important time and yeah. place. No thief in the night stuff, just the Nope. Nope. So the antidote to that, he says, is interpreting Revelation symbolism, first of all, within a first century rather than a 21st century framework, and looking for its symbolically rich message that suggests contemporary analogous realities rather than literal and specific realities. Hmm. So the goal of Revelation is for us to discern the Babylon of our day, right? So Revelation will write about empire, Roman, the Roman Empire, and it will call it Babylon, which right. has a rich history in the Bible. And we are supposed to discern the Babylon of our day. How do we participate in the Babylon of our day? Is the question? It's Hollywood. There's that, a movie that out right Revelation. Now about it. Yes, <laughs> starring the aforementioned Bradley Pitt. All right, I'm going to go through these uh, last several very quick. Uh, number four, treating the Bible like a puzzle where the pieces need to be fit together. Um, instead of, he, and he recommends, reading uh, each biblical book, including Revelation, holistically and contextually for its unique message. So reading it as a part of and in dialogue with the rest of the of biblical canon. Number five, be becoming preoccupied, this is a huge mistake, with questions about the meaning of certain unknowable or less significant aspects of the book. Like, like the rapture isn't even mentioned in Revelation, nor is the, <laughs> is the word antichrist. Not mentioned at all in That's Revelation. Wild. And yet, we're focused, I mean, there will be more opinions on the millennium, which is like four verses yeah. in chapter 20, than then, then the, the incredible revelation of Jesus to his churches, right? I mean, it's, we, we absolutely focus on the, the, the controversial or confusing parts, and it's, it's so dumb. His antidote is saying focus on the bigger thematic issues rather than on the disputed details, letting revelation appeal to the disciplined, informed imagination about theological and spiritual matters and not treating it like an advanced video of the future. And then lastly, failing to hear Revelation in light of the larger Christian, tra uh, larger Christian tradition and contemporary scholarship, as opposed to remembering that people like Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins, and David Jeremiah are not the first, only, or best interpreters of Revelation. So there is so <laughs> much great scholarship out there on the book. Anyway, so that's where we're headed, ladies and gentlemen. Next week will be uh, a little dense as well as we talk about genre. And um, Gorman also gives a list of all of the ways the futurist view of Revelation has hurt us and the things that are wrong with it. So we're just going to go over those and then we'll, we'll talk about what kind of book Revelation is and then we'll start diving into the specifics. But like I said, this, um, this work here is the work that matters most. How it is that we understand the book? Same, it's same with Genesis or any of the like, the 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 passages, Romans, um, the big battles about how it's understood or fought here, in what kind of literature it is, and how do we approach that kind of literature? It's so um, interesting with the inerrancy conversation because through all that, the real errancy is us, right? So it really, it's it's just kind of funny the way that reframes itself, but it's not a question of whether or not the Bible's inerrant, it's just how we yeah, incorrectly we're approach it, yeah. Totally, which is so interesting, right? Because even 
those who advocate for inerrancy say it's inerrant in its original manuscripts, which we don't have. Right. And it says nothing about the inerrancy of the interpreters, which is your point. Right. And right. Like, yeah, that's, yeah, the uh, translations the, are in their own way, in some form of respect, a interpretation. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean they're all equal. No, and but it just are, means that, yeah, you take that into account, like you're just saying with just this book in particular, but in general, like the way that you approach the text is just yeah. as important as anything else or more. Yes, yes. Yes, 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 absolutely. So, and we'll see that, we'll see that so clearly. Over and so, over again. <laughs> yes. So, dear listener, and Chris with a K, avoid that lake of fire. Yes, we need some um, social distortion channeling Johnny Cash around the ring of fire, <laughs> is what we need. Um, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your, um, I don't know, just commitment to our community and, and willingness to allow us to play a small part in your journey. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I've wanted to say this for years. Smash that subscribe button. <laughs> yes. All these influencers. Hey, guys. I mean, they all begin with, hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Like subscri- like, I can't even say it. Right. Hey, guys. Um, anyway, like and subscribe. Smash that subscribe button. Um <laughs> I don't know. Otherwise, go <laughs> about your business. Good sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, if you want to see this train wreck, uh, you can go to YouTube and watch it live. Otherwise, use your imagination. Love it in the in the notes. <laughs> oh my goodness! Anyway, God bless you all. See ya.